Testing. 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 All right. Okay. Welcome to another Hoopo stream. Today we are going to be looking at Paco, parts and attributes of common objects. So this is a uh, new MIT licensed data set that comes out of Facebook research. Um, it has Coco vibes. So if you guys don't know what Coco is, Coco uh, data set, not the Pixar movie. The Coco data set is one of the more famous uh, image detection, segmentation, kind of just computer vision data set. This was done, uh, I think Microsoft is kind of the big one that gets associated with this, but apparently Facebook is also associated with this. And yeah, Coco is a large scale object detection, segmentation and captioning data set that has uh, 1.5 million object instances, roughly 330,000 images. And Paco seems very much on that uh, kind of train. It's the same kind of idea, a large scale data set. Coco is used in a huge amount of uh, benchmarks and papers and a lot of people over time have uh, used Coco. So obviously Paco here kind of intended may maybe to be the uh, successor to that. So if we actually look at the size, significantly smaller, Roughly 60,000 images. So Coco is 300,000 images, Paco 60,000 images. But it looks like the main difference here is that whereas Coco is, uh, uh, let's hit explore. So, uh, person sports ball search. This is kind of what a Coco image would look like, right? You have a rough polygonal segmentation mask, so it's not a perfect uh, pixel segmentation mask, right? These uh, segmentation is the problem of breaking a uh, image into its component parts and identifying what each of the separate parts of the image are. And there's different types of masks. There's, right, this is called a mask. There's masks that are pixel level, which means that the tiny little pixels would be labeled. So here, the inside of this arm here, all of these would be very carefully traced out in a pixel mask. This is called a polygonal mask, and in, in that case, a low poly mask as well. Various different terms there, but you can see that it's, it's kind of a rough uh, mask. And uh, it's also, only kind of one level deep, right? You have a mask for the person and a mask for the ball and a mask for the person here and the racket. Um, versus here in uh, Paco, we have a little bit more and it seems like uh, the big uh, selling point here is what they're calling part masks and then object level attributes and part level attributes. So it seems like what they're gonna be doing is not just a uh, mask around, for example, the knife, but having a handle and a blade, and then it looks like a little vector, which maybe assigns the, uh, like a kind of an orientation for the object. Maybe what is down, what is up, and so on. So yeah, they have their website here. They have, uh, you can download the uh, code and the data relatively easily. And it's of course MIT license, which is great. Um, Coco, the best part about it was that you could use it um, 
terms of use right here. A Creative Commons Attribution License. So basically, you could use it to, to train your own models for your own research or for even for your own startup, and it's completely fine. And it seems like Paco is the same way, so these uh, open source permissively licensed data sets are really what allows uh, machine learning to, to move forward. Um, so good good job there by uh, Facebook Research to, to release this out to the public. So uh, importable as a Python module. Um, they have some Honda environment as well. See actually what is the requirements for this. Okay, so Detectron 2, which is uh, Facebook's uh, computer vision uh, repo. It just kind of has a bunch of generic detection, segmentation, uh, classification, uh, computer vision models. Ego 4D, which is a, a special type of data set. Uh, looks like there actually is going to be a, uh, a part to Paco that is in this kind of Ego 4D video format. We'll probably get into that more. Uh, when we actually look at the paper, uh, Jupyter Notebooks, um, OpenCV, which is Open Computer Vision, which is kind of a famous, um, very famous uh, software package that kind of has been around and has been uh, a key part of the computer vision history uh, for a long time. And... Elvis, which I think is also, it's not the uh, Indiana Elvis computer vision. Data set for large vocabulary and instance segmentation. So it's a data set, but I think it's also a uh, challenge, I guess. And, and there's like an association or an organization associated with it. And then submit it. This. Submit it is a lightweight tool for submitting Python functions for computations with a Slurm cluster. Okay. Slurm is an open source, fault tolerant, and highly scalable cluster management and job scheduling system. So it's it's kind of like a Kubernetes. Uh, but. You don't really see Slurm in uh, a lot of production situations. I think Kubernetes is more popular, but Slurm is more popular in uh, academic institutions. So a lot of academic labs use uh, Slurm. Okay. So that is most of what we can glean from this repo here. Actually, maybe we can probably go here into the insights tab and look at the uh, contributors. Um, also look at the commits. It's going to take a second to load this so we can see that the repo was really first created in uh, 2023, so very fresh repo. This is kind of the main guy here, Vladan Petrovic. And then you have this other guy here, uh, Iko Eltosiar Ashimine. Okay, so some guy in Tokyo, some guy in San Jose. Um, we can actually see guys. And in terms of the commit, this isn't really something that has been going on for a while. They just kind of dumped all of this data or all of this code uh, just in this year. And for these data sets, I doubt they usually don't necessarily uh, continue to contribute to these repos. These are basically just like a one-time drop. I know for Coco, there's a popular PyCoco tools. Yeah, so it's not the right one. But basically, there's a, a GitHub repo with, uh, I think it might be this one, yeah. But they call it the official API, but basically it's just additional tooling to to make it easier to uh, test and evaluate uh, on these data sets. 
So I assume that's what will eventually get contributed to this repo. Um, this is the main guy. Very secretive. And this is the other main contributor. Uh, wow, this guy loves to code. That that's impressive amounts of contributions there. Yeah. So we went ahead and opened the uh, paper, which you can find here on their paper link, and we opened it in Paperpile, which is our kind of favorite uh, paper management tool. Uh, Paperpile, please sponsor me. So this is a little paper that goes along with this uh, data set. Okay. So for January 2023, relatively new paper. Uh, relatively large team as well. That's a lot of people. You got maybe 10 different people working on this. Uh, the main organization here seems to be meta ai and then you have uh an academic institution as well simon fraser but that's just really just this one guy here okay you got this nice big figure here pocket includes objects with object mask attributes part mask and part part attribute object instance queries composed of object and part attributes are shown with corresponding positive images in green and negative images in red okay so not only do they have the actual images but it sounds like maybe they actually also have associations between these images so uh positive negative image pairs where this is a dog these are not a dog and so on although in this case it's it's more nuanced versions of that where you have metal mug with a black handle and it's not just a metal mug and then a picture of scissors or something it's a metal mug and then they have a picture of a mug it just doesn't it's not metal and it doesn't have a black handle so i think this kind of more nuanced data set might be useful okay get into this abstract here object models are gradually progressing from predicting just category labels to providing detailed descriptions of object instances uh yeah, I think especially the combination of modalities that we're seeing where image and text are kind of becoming more and more the same thing, or at least both used as part of a larger AI model. I think that this is becoming more and more true. Motivates the need for large data sets which go beyond traditional object, object masks and provide richer annotations such as part masks and tributes. Here we introduce Paco, parts and attributes of common objects. 75 object categories, 456 object part categories, 55 attributes. Cross image and video data sets. Okay, so I think now we're understanding why Elvis and Ego4D are in here. So I think that the actual source of the images itself might be from Elvis and Ego4D. So this is basically, they took previously existing data sets and then re-annotated them uh, with these kind of more fine-grained annotations. So we provide 641K part masks annotated across 260K object boxes with roughly half of them exhaustively annotated with attributes as well. We design evaluation metrics and provide benchmark results for three tasks on the data set. Part mask segmentation, object and part attribute prediction, and zero shot instance detection. Okay. So zero shot instance detection, obviously that's been around for a very long time object and part attribute prediction depending on how they formulate that there might be some novelty to that uh formula that problem 
and then part mask segmentation again depending on how they kind of treat that uh there might be some novelty there as well when it comes to the actual end-to-end -end system design data sets model and code are open sourced at A task requiring fine-grained understanding of objects like vocabulary detection, uh, question answering, and referen referring expressions are gaining importance besides traditional object detection. Representing objects through category labels is no longer sufficient. A complete object description requires more fine-grained properties like object parts and their attributes. Currently, there are no large benchmark datasets for common objects with joint annotation of part masks. Such datasets are found only in specific domains like clothing, birds, and pedestrian. So, yeah, I think the, the common objects here is a main part, right? Like when Coco... I have to keep type data set. When the Coco data set came out, right, a huge reason why it became super popular is because of the broad uh, categories that were used, right? You have everything from motorcycles to dogs to uh, people to whatever this is. This actually looks like a cow or something, right? And there was a period in computer vision where pretty much every data set was very specific. So constrained to something like clothing or birds or autonomous vehicle data sets, which are basically just cars and people. So I think ImageNet itself is also very constrained. So uh, ImageNet data set is actually mostly dogs, basically. Um, pictures. They're a nice picture of ImageNet. But PLDR, like most of these data sets are usually constrained to a specific kind of niche. So as kind of computer vision has grown and continued to, to kind of expand, we've seen the growth of these data sets that are, that are more and more broad and have a higher and higher variance when it comes to the uh, categories. Okay, so there are some data sets that provide object level attributes, however, none have part level attribute annotations. In this work, we enable research for the joint task of object detection, part segmentation, and attribute recognition. Okay. So there's an image data set which is sourced from Elvis, and then there's a video data set which is sourced from Ego4D. So they are basically taking already existing data sets and then just annotating them. Paco has 641k part masks. Annotated 77k images for 260k object instances across 75 object classes and 456 object specific part classes. Order of magnitude more objects with parts. Uh, 55 different attributes for both objects and parts. Here what these are. I think this might be the little vector that they show here. So these like up and down vectors could be what they refer to as attributes. Okay, they provide three associated uh, benchmark tasks to help the community evaluate. Part segmentation, attribute detection, and zero shot instant detection queries.
Okay, some key design choices that they decided or that they had to pick. We evaluate parts and attributes conditioned on the object or independent of the object. Yeah, so um you have this uh knife here, right? There's two parts. Here there's a handle and the blade and basically are you saying are you giving the model okay, this is a knife. Now which part of it is the blade or is blade and handle kind of separate? So it's basically the conditioning here I think is a more interesting uh, part of exploring these kind of like more detailed segmentation tasks where are you just treating it as a segmentation task where there is just instead of 50 categories, there's now 500 categories, right? Instead of 75 object categories, there's now 456 object categories or are you basically treating it like a kind of subsequent steps in a multi-step pipeline where depending on the first classification into an object, then you further classify the individual parts, right? Uh, parts of different objects virtually independent classes. Uh, they predict object parts and attributes jointly. Okay. To keep annotation costs limited, we can construct a federated data set, as suggested in Elvis. For object detection, Elvis showed that this enables fair evaluation without needing exhaustive annotations for every image. Object detection requires every region to be associated with only one label. Oh. This subtle but important difference makes it non-trivial to extend definition of implementation metrics from Elvis to our setup. Okay, we provide a nuanced treatment of missing labels at different levels. Handle this. Yeah, so I think this is not only important to reduce the overall annotation cost, but I think that you're going to have different numbers of parts for different objects, right? Some objects such as this knife, there's going to be two parts. Uh, some objects such as this scissor, there's going to be three parts. So if you're predicting both the object and all of its parts, but there's different amounts of parts per object, then you need to have some way to basically, uh, as they say here, provide a nuanced treatment of missing labels at different levels and different numbers of labels at different levels. Okay, so they're gonna be using average precision and average recall. Um, they're very nice. image on Wikipedia for this that really paints it. Okay, so uh, if you have this data set of little circles here and some of these circles, let's say they're dogs and some of these circles are cats, right? And then these are the, uh, this is what you're predicting here. So precision is basically how many of the positives, how many of the dogs that you predicted correctly as dogs over how many of the uh, dogs that you predicted as dogs and the cats that you actually falsely predicted as cats. So precision is roughly a how many retrieved items are relevant. So like of the detections that you uh, made, how many of them are actually correct basically, the precision. And then recall is of the predictions that you made, how many did you leave out basically? So there's a trade-off between these, right? In in any kind of computer vision model, you're gonna basically trade off the precision and the recall. If you have a very high recall, you're often gonna end up with a lot of uh a lot of false negatives or 
not false negative. You have a high recall. That means your detector is kind of trigger happy and it's just always triggering on things, which means you're going to have false positives, right? You're sometimes going to detect dogs that aren't actually there. So depending on your application or your use case or your problem, you're going to want to trade off precision and recall differently. So related work, of course, they're going to mention Elvis, Coco, and ImageNet. Uh, they mention a couple more here. Elvis, Object 365, Open Images, and Pascal. A uh, couple OCR data sets there as well. OCR. Uh, optical character recognition, which is basically detecting text. Uh, so Elvis, which is of course the data set that they're using here, and they're just re-annotating it. They like this uh, federated annotations concept that Elvis introduced, which makes it possible to scale larger vocabularies without drastically increasing annotation costs. Pixel level part annotations. So these do seem like pixel level annotations, right? Look at this uh, guitar here, right? It's very carefully traced out so that ideally every pixel is correctly labeled as either belonging to the table or the body of the guitar and so on. So the resolution of your mask is important in these problems. Cityscapes is a uh, uh, autonomous vehicle data set. They have ADE 20K here. Okay, so kind of, they keep trying to set themselves apart from previous data sets by kind of saying that, hey, they have many more object categories, and each of those object categories has many more parts. So they're really kind of going heavy on this data set kind of being the state-of-the-art data set when it comes to just the amount of parts and, and objects they have. Domain specific attribute objects or data sets. Uh, motivation of our work is to extend rich descriptions to common objects and object parts as well. Uh, so this data set here that they're talking about, visual attributes in the wild, VAW, added explicit negative attribute annotations to provide a rigorous benchmark for object attribute classification. So that's uh, this part here. So having explicit, this is a dog with a black ear, white foot, and brown leg, right? And then this is that same dog, but it doesn't have a brown leg. And this is the same dog, but it doesn't have a white foot. So it's not just complete uh, negative examples. It's it's a negative examples that are very close to the tr to the actual example, which is useful. Okay, so there are other data sets that have this kind of object and then part annotation style and. When compared to those, uh, Paco here tries to say that theirs is a common object category, so it's a higher variance when it comes to the actual subject of the data set. The 
Data set construction. All right. Paco is constructed from Elvis in the image domain and Ego4D in the video domain. We chose Elvis due to its large object vocabulary and federated dataset construction. Ego4D has temporally aligned narrations, right? So it's a video and then they have text that is basically aligned to specific frames, which means that there's, yeah, there's frames that correspond to specific objects. Um, so actually, before we go into this next section here, let's look at this table here. We have this table. Comparison of publicly available parts and attributes data sets. So these are data sets that have the same kind of like uh, multiple levels of like hierarchy when it comes to uh, classes and categories. So have Paco here at the very end. You have the two different types of Paco, so Paco Elvis and Paco Ego 4D. Um, you have Fashionpedia, which is the one I mentioned here. Of course, you have Coco. So object domain, they're basically saying common or fashion, so I don't know if I would call cityscapes common. I would say cityscapes is definitely more constrained. Uh, and you know it's constrained because it really only it only has five object categories, right? I think to, to call yourself a common object data set, you need to have something more like this, right? 158 categories, 2,260 2, categories. Okay, uh, object masks, number of images with object masks. So number of object masks. This is roughly how many object instances you have. So this gives you a rough idea of like the, the scale of the data set. So 180K for Coco, roughly twice that for Paco. And then I think the biggest one here is this AD 400K. So I think for data set size, right, and model size and things like that, uh, you want to think in like orders of magnitude. So basically what I'm seeing here is these are all in the like 10K range. And then Paco, ADE, Coco, these are all in the 100K range. But none of these are in the million range. And the negative labels Coco has negative labels, I did not know that. Okay, but this is kind of cool. And if you're uh, working on a uh, problem where you need a data set for detection or segmentation or something like that, I think this is a nice little uh, chart that you can uh, figure out which data set you want. So, oh. problem, hope it helps. Okay, so now let's get into uh, here, 2.2 object vocabulary selection. So we mined all object categories mentioned in the narrations accompanying Ego4D and took the intersection with common and frequent categories in Elvis. We then chose categories with at least 20 instances in Ego4D resulting in 75 categories commonly found in both Elvis and Ego4D. Okay, so because they combine, they use two different data sets to make this data set, right? They use Elvis and Ego4D, and Elvis and Ego4D are gonna have different object categories. So they basically took both of those uh, data sets and kind of overlapped, and then the center of the Venn diagram are the, ab are the object categories that they decided to use for Ego4D, or for Paco, sorry. There is no exhaustive ontology for the parts of common objects. I think this is important, right? It's like, 
there's a million different ways to break an object into its separate parts. And different languages are actually going to have different ways of breaking down objects and what parts belong to what object and so on. So you kind of just have to decide and then just add that bias. Seems like they mined part names from web images. They somehow scraped the internet to manually curated such mind part names. Yeah, I don't, at the end of the day, this is something you just manually curate, right? This isn't, I don't know what they're trying to say here with mining the part names. There's 200 part classes shared across all 75 objects. And then object specific parts is 456. Okay, so of the 456 object part classes or categories, 200 of them are actually shared. So that means that if we go up here, right, there's going to be different parts. So shoulder, the ring, the neck, the body. Right, I mean, I don't know if I 100% agree with this, just because there's going to be such a huge difference, right? The, the neck of a bottle and the neck of a dog are just completely different things. The body of the car, I don't know if you necessarily gain anything by having a common label for parts that belong to different categories here, but I'm, I'm sure they actually talk about that, and maybe there is a little bit of benefit from doing that. We constructed an in-depth user study, all right, nice, to identify the sufficient set of attributes that can separate all objects instances. This led to the final vocabulary of 29 colors, 10 patterns and markings, and 13 materials and three levels of reference. I don't even know if I could name 29 colors. That seems like a lot of colors. Our overall data annotation pipeline consists of object bounding boss mask annotation. Okay. Part mask annotation. Object and part attribute. And instance IDs. Yeah, instance IDs are uh, important. So a lot of times in a data set like this, right, like for example, this image of the dog here, some data sets, all they'll do is they'll say, hey, this is, these are dogs, right? And as far as your machine learning model is concerned, like these could both be the same dog, right? That just knows that this part of the image corresponds to the class dog. But instance IDs is basically having the additional annotation that these are two separate dogs and this is one instance of a dog and that's another instance of a dog, right? Because for example, in this train, this, there's two separate masks here, right? There's this part of the train and then this part of the train, but they're both the same instance, right? So you're basically saying, even though there's two different masks here, two different blobs, these are both correspond to the same instance of the same train, rather than this being one train and then this being... So that additional instance ID is useful. Uh, a lot of problems. Bounding boxes and masks are already available for the 75 object classes in Elvis, but not Ego 4D. Ego 4D, we use the provided narrations to identify timestamps and videos for object classes. Sampled 100 frames around these timestamps and asked annotators to choose at most five diverse frames. cat but
All right, getting back into it. So object annotation, because they're using a video data set, they basically have to sample specific frames, right? So you have to pick frames in the video that then turn into images and then annotations are only for an image, right? So if you had a video of these two dogs, every single frame in that video would have to be annotated. So annotating videos is significantly more expensive than annotating images because you have a 30 frame per second video, you're annotating 30 images per second of video. Yeah, and a, many of the frames in that video might have things like motion blur or occlusion, which makes the annotation even more difficult. Asked annotators to annotate mass. So I bet you they used a uh, external service like Mechanical Turk or something like Scale AI for uh, annotation services. We do not distinguish between different instances of a part in an object instance, but provide a single mask covering all pixels of a part class in the object. Okay, interesting. So they don't have instances for the parts themselves. So if you had a car and then the car has four wheels, so technically you could say there's four different instances of the wheel part within that car, but they're basically going to say, no, there's only the wheels to the car. So they decided not to provide instance level masks for object parts within an object. Rebounding box in Ego 4D is annotated with object and part level attributes. Meaning exhaustive attribute annotations for all object and part instances, very expensive. Yeah. <laughs> Go to scale AI. What does it cost? Pricing. Let's see what data annotation costs right now. Meet pricing. Uh, scale image. Want pricing. View pricing. None of this is you. I need. Show me the money. Get started. Wow, they really don't want you to to know. But yeah, Scale AI is basically a, a service that you could use to annotate. So if you have um, any kind of data and you want annotations, right, which is masks, uh, bounding boxes, pixel masks, uh, key points, so on, uh, you can basically pay a company like Scale AI, and usually it's a couple cents per image, but for something a little bit more complicated like a pixel segmentation, uh, it's going to be more expensive. You can spend up to dollars per image. Then uh, it can get very expensive very quick, especially if you have a large data set. Okay, instance annotation. So introduce a zero shot instance detection task with our data set. Okay, so again, instance being a single instance of one of the things. So in this case, instance detection, just a single one of these dogs. Zero shot just refers to uh, no fine tuning on a specific class. Usually that just means you uh, trained on a generic data set and then you immediately apply it to a new uh, type of data set that is of a, a that is different from the one you trained on. So that's what zero shot usually refers to here.
we underwent a rigorous multi-stage process to annotate the instance IDs. This resulted in a 16,000 unique object instances and 50,000 annotated. Each stage in the annotation pipeline had multiple associated quality control methods, such as use of gold standard and annotation audits. So I assume this basically just means ten to fifty instances of each object annotated by expert annotators set aside as gold annotations. Okay, so basically expert annotators were probably the writers of this paper. In this case is probably these guys here, Vignesh, Anmal, and Vladin. So these guys manually annotated uh, images, actually probably these ones here, the, the ones that they show, probably the, this, this image, this uh, image of this ginger flavor bottle, and so on. And then those they consider the gold standard annotations. So whenever they pay a company like Scale AI, they're saying, hey, this is what I want, and this is a gold standard annotation. So I want all the annotations that you get your third world people to label for me, uh, to look like this one. For part mask annotations, they measured uh, intersection over union, mean intersection over union, that's what IOU means, with gold images and re-annotated object classes with MIOU less than 50%. Eventually, 90% of the object classes have MIOU greater than or equal to 0.75. For all attribute annotations, we were checking quality by randomly sampling annotations, finding patterns in annotation errors, updating guidelines to correct clear biases, and re-annotating erroneous samples. So this is the, the generic annotation flow. So when you're getting an external partner, such as Scale AI, to annotate images for you, Scale AI, what they're really doing is they're going and they're basically getting a bunch of people in like the Philippines or in like Bangladesh to sit there and stare at these images and annotate them for you, right? They're going to the lowest cost uh, possible market, which is gonna be some third world country that has computers. And then they're gonna get people in those third world countries to annotate these images for you. But the problem with that is that a lot of times you have all these quality control issues, right? Because the, the, the person in the Philippines that's sitting there drawing a little mask around your object, they're getting paid per image. And they just want to crank through a bunch of those images. So they're not, they're not, they don't really care to make the best possible thing. So what this process ends up looking like is you give them a bunch of images. You say, here are the gold standard ones. This is what I want you to annotate like. You're going to get back all the things. You're going to kind of sift through the annotated images. You're going to say, okay, these are trash. These are good. Reannotate these. Uh, in this one, you didn't get the car wheels and so on. And it's kind of like this iterative process with these annotation companies in order to reduce the uh, quality issues. Okay. Dataset statistics. So they have some stats on kind of the distribution within this data set. Let's see what we got. Okay. Just scrolling down to see how much more of this paper we have. We have a couple more sections. So figure 2A shows the number of part masks annotated for each object part category in Paco Elvis and Paco Ego 4D. We observe the typical long tail distribution, right? So these common object categories, you're gonna have a ton of different weird categories. So weird parts like book cover, chair back, so on. Categories like fan, logo, and kettle cable having fewer than five. So you have, this is what they're calling the long tail. So there's some, uh, some things like cow horn, there's only gonna be like three examples of a cow horn, but other things like dog, there's probably thousands of examples of dogs. So 
there's kind of a fundamental imbalance in the data set where certain object categories and here in this case certain object category or object part categories are going to be significantly more represented than others and not only that but then there's also kind of the large medium and small so some things are very small some things are larger and that there's going to be a larger fraction of part masks belong to low and medium size compared to object mass. So the object masks tend to be bigger, part mass tend to be smaller. I think here they meant to say small. Figure 2B. Small, medium, large. Why don't we promote our YouTube channel by opening up a uh, ticket here? Typo in paper. This is our favorite thing to do. So we show a little typo and then uh, I think you meant a. Belong to small and medium size. Belong to small and size. Instead of and then we tell them great. Love, great work. I think page or in section, give them the section, uh, section three. that so there's two points one does this really matter no they don't actually give a shit right like at the end of the day no one's gonna care no one really reads this paper but you give them the you create this ticket right then hopefully they click on your link hopefully they look at your repo hopefully they go here and they look at oh look at this youtube hoopo oh what is that let me open that and then they open that and then they see that and then oh wow Look at this. It's a channel with a guy and he's reviewing our paper. Oh, wow. Maybe I'll look at that some other time. And that is how you uh, create organic links back to your YouTube content so that over time your YouTube grows. So that's the uh, reason why I'm opening these tickets uh, for small uh, typos in these papers. Okay, figure 2C shows the number of annotations per attribute and attribute type in Paco Elvis. We observe a long-tailed distribution with common attributes like colors having many annotations, while uncommon ones like translucent having fewer annotations. Okay, so similar kind of situation. And I think this is true just for daily life in general, like in all things. Like you're going to see cars more often than you ever see flamingos, so... Uh, there is kind of a long tail distribution to just life in general, so I think it's okay for the data sets to have that.
and you can see here the the long tail here so for example dark orange oh, dark orange is very rare but black and white and gray and brown are much more common Paco has 10 times more object instance parts compared to the next closest parts benchmark data set for common objects. In Paco, every object part mask is annotated with attributes is with all attributes in the vocabulary. Okay, so they decided on a vocabulary of words. I think this is where the user study comes in. And then they made sure to use all of the vocabulary when annotating the object in part masks. Okay, so that's a description of the data set. And now we're moving into section four, which is the tasks and evaluation benchmark. Our first two tasks directly evaluate the quality of part segmentation and attributes prediction. So of course they're going to split into train, validation, and test. This is standard practice in machine learning where you want to separate your data into data that you're going to train on, data that you're going to validate on, and validation is basically uh, as you're training, right? As you're feeding uh, batches from your training split, as it's called, or training data set, the, the data that's part of your training uh, bucket, you're occasionally going to evaluate your model. And the data that you evaluate your model on is going to be called the validation split or the validation uh, bucket or the validation data set. And then your test data set, you keep it in a secret box until the very end and you evaluate at the very end of your uh, training uh, pipeline. And that'll give you the best possible uh, quantitative metric of how good you're scoring on this data set. Okay, so these are the uh, actual splits here. So they have 15,000 train, 826 validation, and 9,000 tests. So again, yeah, validation is smaller than the test. Um, the test is actually pretty big here. The, it's, it's almost like one-third. That's usually not the split you see. And usually the splits that I see are like 80-10-10 is a popular one. So 80% of your data into train, 10% into validation, and then 10% into test. Um, and if you have an absolutely massive data set, the test and validation might be even smaller. But the reason that this seems a little bit weird is that normally the bigger you make your train data set, the better, right? So like if you put images into your test data set, you're not going to be able to train on them. So if you only have 10 images, you don't want five of them in your test data set so that you're only training on five images, right? You want to be training on as many of those images as possible. So you would train on nine images and have one in your test data set. Obviously no one's training on a 10 image data set, but uh, that kind of gives you an idea of why the splits tend to be biased towards making the train as big as possible. Uh, we briefly review the concept of federated data set. This is something that they keep mentioning here, and that is where every image in the evaluation set is not annotated exhaustively with all object categories. And every object category has a set of negative images that are guaranteed not to contain any instance of the object. Okay. And B, a set of exhaustive positive images that are where all instances of the object are annotated. And then a set of non-exhaustive positive images with at least one instance of the object annotated. Okay, so this is what the actual label looks like. It's a tuple here of the object and the part. 
object part pairs, basically. We consider parts of different instances of the object to be different object part instances. Okay. So, in reality, the way that uh, the model sees these images is it basically sees this mask here and it's uh, scissors finger hole, scissors blade, scissors screw, and scissors handle. So it's almost like there's four different or five different actual objects here, right? To the model, uh, scissors finger hole and scissors blade, it's not, it's almost like different things. So Basically, they're they're putting in this uh, bias, this implicit bias of basically everything has one level of hierarchy where every part has an object. There isn't like parts of parts, right? It's always going to be this tuple of like object and part. We expect the models to produce both an object and a part label with a single joint score. AP is averaged over different thresholds of intersection over union. So intersection over union is how much your prediction and the actual ground truth overlap, right? And you have to define a threshold for those. Like, what is a correct, um, get a good IOU uh, threshold. Yeah, so how much do they need to overlap for you to say that this is a correct prediction, right? So here, the predicted bounding box, right, this white one versus the ground truth bounding box, this green one, there's only a 35% overlap. Here, 55, 75, 95% overlap. So there's a threshold at which you say, if it's, I don't know, say 95% overlapping, then it's a correct prediction. And when people report metrics such as uh, average precision, you basically have to define at what IOU threshold is that AP calculation done. Yeah, we compute AP for the object part at a given IOU threshold. Okay, so these are different models here. This is a ResNet 50. This is a ResNet 101. Uh, this is a uh, vision transformer, uh, and then this is a uh, vision transformer large, so two different sizes of vision transformers. Um, and then you he see here the uh, different uh, average precision for the mask, and then average precision for uh, a bounding box. So actually, this lets you see the uh, relative performance between uh, ResNet 101, which is kind of a more classic uh, computer model architecture versus the vision transformers, which are uh, the, obviously the new uh, fancy, not fancy because at this point they're pretty commonplace, but the new type of uh, deep learning architecture. So you can actually see that uh, even the big ResNet, the ResNet 101 has a 31 score compared to the transformer, vision transformer 42 score. So vision transformers definitely Definitely want to be using that if you can. Okay, so they have these two non-exhaustive positive images and exhaustive positive images. This is like uh, what they were describing before with different there's going to be images where not everything is labeled and so on, but here they're kind of explaining how, whether or not those count towards the average percent.
So instance level attribute prediction. So this is a task where you have to produce the mask and or bounding boxes along with a category label. Uh, and that's either gonna be the object label or the object part label, right? Which is basically that tuple as well as an attribute label and a single joint confidence score for the category with the attribute. Okay, so this is the extra kind of attribute uh, vocabulary that they had, right? Where they had the 29 different words for colors. So they have the category be the object O or the object part. They have an attribute as well. We treat all predicted masks in negative images of the object O as false positive. Yeah, so I think the, the good thing about what they're doing here is that your test data set it's lazy to just make it a, a random subset of your training data set. When you're designing a test data set, especially for something that you intend to, to kind of be used as a benchmark, you want to design it in such a way that it, it kind of gives you specifically tricky examples and a, a large variance of different examples that are tricky for different reasons. So this whole thing with exhaustive images, non-exhaustive positive images, negative images, positive images, like they're basically picking very like kind of tricky examples, like examples where you have a dog and then examples where it seems like you should have a dog, but there is no dog. And then examples where you have two dogs and only one of the dogs is labeled. So they're kind of being tricky about how they pick their test data set such that the actual scores that you get are a little bit more informative because it, it kind of tests a bunch of interesting uh, edge cases where your model could have some issue, right? And you really get to pick apart, like what does recall mean? What does precision mean for this particular model? Okay, so they have different metrics here, right? They have uh, an object AP, which is uh, average precision for a specific attribute and for a given object, and then object part AP, which is the same thing except it's average precision for a specific object part tuple at an uh, attribute. Then they have the mean of that across all attributes. And then they have the mean of that across different types of attributes, such as color, uh, patterns and markings, material, and so on. Reflectance, because it's how shiny things are. So that's where all these different subscores are, right? And because they have all these different types of AP that are calculated from all the different weird edge cases that they chose for their test data set, you can get a much broader set of uh, evaluation numbers to look at. So whenever you actually train your model, you can actually more finely compare where your model is struggling and where your model is uh, strong. So you can actually compare, okay, well, when it comes to the color part, right? When it comes to color detecting, adding an, a color attribute, how does the ResNet FPN 50 here compare to the transformer, right? So 
the transformer uh just the generic uh object uh part right has a score of 13 and for the resnet and then the color has a score of 11. the transformer has a score of 18 here and then has a score of 14. so You know, maybe the ResNet is a little bit, I don't know, it's worse in both ways. It's worse in both metrics, but it's, it doesn't drop as much versus the transformer here drops a little bit harder. I don't know. Maybe that doesn't actually help you very much, but that's the point, right, is that you can be a little bit uh, more nuanced with your evaluation by having a test set that is more engineered as opposed to just randomly sampled from your training set okay then this is the the final task that they're uh giving a benchmark here for uh, zero shot instance detection requires an algorithm to retrieve the bounding box of a specific instance of an object based on a query describing the instance okay so the zero shot here isn't in reference to uh the data set, which is what I thought. It's in reference to the actual category that it's using. These queries are composed of both object and part attributes at different levels of composition. Okay, so we first define a level K query as describing an object instance, this is green, in terms of K attributes of the objects. For example, blue mug or blue mug with a or mug with a blue handle handle are sample L1 queries, whereas blue striped mug is a L2 query, and then blue striped mug with a white handle is an L3 query. Okay, so basically the number of attributes or properties of a object define kind of the the L1, L2, L3, LN or LK query. We measure the performance through average recall. AR at K, where K denotes the top K boxes returned by the method for a query. So top K is basically in a uh, any kind of classification problem, right? The model is going to output uh, not a fine, not just one thing like dog. What it's actually outputting is a uh, probabilities, right, or logits, right? Like basically scores for each category. This is, and it's gonna say, okay, this is 99% confidence of dog, 20% confidence of cow, 1% confidence of car, right? So sometimes these categories are close enough, right? There's enough categories that like husky and dog, like so, so many of them are similar that sometimes the model will say it's a husky when it should be a dog. And instead of just saying, what is the the top one? You say, what are the top K? What are the top five? So if you have a picture of a dog and it guesses husky, but dog is in the top five guesses, then you're going to say, okay, well, that's close enough. So that's why sometimes you see top five is, a, is one that you see a lot, but that's where these top K uh, kind of scores come from. Okay, so they trained a, two mask RCNNs and two uh, vision transformers. Uh, use a 100 epoch, which means they train on the data set 100 times. Uh, and then there's some learning rate scheduling going on there. And LSJ augmentation. What is LSJ augmentation? Simple copy paste is a strong data augmentation for 
instance segmentation. No. In search for hyperparameter, we train on train, search for hyperparameters on val, and report results on test. Okay. We trained with a cascade as well as a feature pyramid network. And the results for models trained and evaluated on Paco Elvis are summarized in table two. Larger and better backbones like VIT large are seen to performance. So VIT transformers are better than uh, Convnets, which I think most people use. simple extensions, additional attribute head on the shared backbone. The attribute head uses the same ROI pooled, so region of interest, as the detection head to predict object and object part attributes. We use a separate cross entropy loss for each attribute type. Okay, so there's going to be there's a different head here for each of the different types of attributes, right? So they had uh, a couple different attribute uh, kind of categories. So they have color, patterns, material, and reflectance. And for each of those, there's going to basically be a different head that's classifying with a different number, right? So the color head uh, is trained with the cross entropy loss, but only for other colors, right? So not all attributes are, uh, on. not all attributes are basically on the same output layer. Each of them has their own little head for that. Tribute prediction is a much harder task than object detection. Larger models fare better. We observe a huge gap between lower and upper bounds with our original models only partially bridging it. This shows scope for future improvements in the attribute prediction ability for models. We use a single scoring function that combines these different scores using a geometric mean to get the final score for each box. Okay, so this is the different number of, of uh, attributes in the query, right? So L1 is black mug, L3 is a black metallic something mug and then l2 would just be black metallic so the score for just one attribute is better than the score for three attributes which is better than so the the switching of the three and the two here is weird and the way that they describe this is more complex queries provide more information about the object instance making l3 tasks easier than l2 Okay. To get a sense of the gap between open vocabulary detection and our task specific models, we evaluate the publicly available models from Detic MDetter. So this is the uh, Facebook's uh, transformer for images. Okay, so basically these two models that they train that are not specifically this task aren't performing as well on their benchmark. And they say, okay, well, 
an opportunity for future research. Comparison with few shot models on Paco Ego 4D. Few shot instance detection is the task where an algorithm is given as input k positive frames with bounding boxes for an object instance and is expected to retrieve another bounding box of the same instance from an unseen set of images. Okay, so this is more what I was talking about where you have a test data set that is separate. Basically, you're evaluating it on images from a different data distribution than the one that it was um, trained on. So they benchmark a naive two-stage model. So this is the ResNet, small ResNet, ResNet 50. We notice a 20 plus point gap even between our best zero shot model and the one shot model. So these are basically the figures for the paragraphs we just read. We have table five here, zero shot instance detection results for different query levels. So this is the number of queries, right? And I mean, these are pretty much on par here. 22, 20, 22, like all these numbers are pretty much the same here. Five, 29, 31, this is a little bit more interesting. Uh, yeah, another interesting trend here, of course, is the difference between the transformers and the confnets. You can see how the transformers are like uh, almost 10 points higher, significantly better. All right, table six, zero shot instance detection performance of an open vocabulary detector. So AR at one, so this is uh top five predictions and AR at one is the top prediction. So AR at one is a much more stringent uh, metric because you the model has to get it correct. It has to be the top prediction for it to count as a correct prediction versus AR at five, if it's in the top five predictions, it counts as a correct prediction. So this is a more lenient metric. So L1 of the object, L1 with the part. This is a Swin transformer. So this is another type of transformer here. These scores are terrible, man, like five. All right, comparing performance of a few shot model with our zero shot model. So this is how many um, examples you're giving it of this new object class basically you're showing it a picture with a bounding box of something it's never seen before and then this is how many of them you're giving it and obviously the more you give it uh the better it's going to perform although for example here these don't actually it doesn't make a difference you, you can give it five examples of this new thing that you want or one example of this new thing one is roughly the same All right, conclusion. We introduce Paco, a data set designed to enable research towards joint detection of objects, parts, and attributes of common objects. It provides part masks and attributes for 75 object categories spanning both image and video data sets. We introduce three benchmark tasks which showcase unique challenges in the data set. Unlike object detection, these tasks require algorithms to cope better with smaller masks belonging to parts and have features that are not invariant to instance level attributes. Scroll into the uh, appendix here. Sample web images used to mine part vocabulary. 
I mean, this is just such a formal way of describing. We we went on the internet and we like decided what different parts of objects are. You know, <laughs> like I don't think you needed to. I don't think you need to call that mining part vocabulary, right? You're just kind of browsing the internet to determine what those are. So, screwdriver has a tip, a blade, a shank, and a handle, and so on. This is the illustrative reference for the annotators. Again, so they're using some external service such as Scale.ai to uh, annotate this for them. Scale.ai is using people in third world countries. So you have to provide them with an example of like, hey, this is the different parts that I want you to annotate on a trash can. Uh, these are the five kind of types of attributes. This is the different parts for the different objects here. So you can see how the, the body happens multiple times. Bottom of the basket. The top of the carton. The body of the calculator and the body of the can. Annotators noted that around 50% of shape differences contain unnameable attributes. Hence, we removed shape from the final list of attributes. I wonder if they actually say what they use, which company they use to do this annotation. Randomly sampled top row and bottom masks for a subset of attributes. Nice little uh, visualization here where they basically just extract the masks and then for each of the different attributes you can see. This is probably a great way to check the uh, quality of the data set because for things like color, it should be very obvious. Everything here should be blue. Everything here should be yellow and so on. This is the mask RCNN. So, uh, backbone is the part where they switch the, uh, the, that's where they can do this, right? Oops. That's where they uh, either use a ResNet or a Vision Transformer. But then once you get out of that, you still have all the same kind of parts from a classic kind of mask RCNN, right? This is the two-shot detection. So you have one model that just converts this image into a feature map, right? Just a tensor with a bunch of numbers in it that represent the image in a little bit better way, right? And then you have all this extra crap on top of here, right? You have a region proposal network that then gives you uh, little boxes and then for each of those boxes you're then running those through uh, here you have some confs some conv nets right so 7 by 7 by 256 that's like the size of the kernel that you're uh, running through this uh, feature map here you have FC is fully connected which basically just means uh, your standard kind of multi-layer perceptron like just a bunch of neurons all connected to each other so 1,024 of them, followed by another 1,024 of them. And then the final output of this uh, head here is four numbers which represent the position and size of a box, and then uh, 531 possible classes, right? Where the class here is the object part pair, right? Like the tuple. You have here each of the four heads, right? So the four the attributes have their own little head. So color has its own head, which picks 
has a 29 dimensional output for each of the colors. Pattern marking, lectins, different heads for those. Oblation study on the importance of object part and attribute prediction. Okay, so this is how much of it do they give to the model, I guess, when they're doing this query type problem, and then how much better the score gets. So actually an interesting thing here is uh, if you look at object plus part then object plus color these are very tiny shitty scores here but object plus part plus color huge jump right so from 10 and 15 but then both of those together 40 so the part and the color together really do seem to kind of give you that that big boost there Default data augmentation. Learning rate of 0.04, that's a pretty big learning rate. And they have a batch size of 128, and then they're using 32 GPUs, so they definitely burned a lot of GPUs for this. These are just more examples. So one thing to note here is that these images are all kind of weirdly sized, right? There, there's, there isn't a consistency in the size, and sometimes that's an issue because that you end up like kind of warping things. Alrighty, so. Yeah, maybe my high level thoughts on this. So I think that I like to see this. I like to see uh, kind of open source data sets. Um, I like to see uh, big companies like Facebook Research pay for the annotation cost to uh, create these and, and annotate these large data sets. Um, this obviously gives you benchmarks too, which then you can use in your own research. Uh, I think I may be a little bit skeptical that segmentation and detection and, and these type of like tasks are going to continue in the future. I think multiple modality, like text and image models will eventually remove all this crap you know what i'm saying like at the most applications like they don't necessarily care like which part of the image is the blender they just care if you can tell that there's a blender here or not right so like these type of problem formulations where like you're basically making these masks of like this part of the image is the blender i don't think you're going to need that in the future i think that that kind of like over engineered supervised learning uh, style uh, training paradigm where you have basically very like pixel level masks and you're paying people to, to draw these masks. I think like to me, I don't see that being a thing 10 years from now. So maybe this is kind of like the last huzzah of like these kind of like high effort annotation type data sets and the models that come out of it. But I think there's definitely still time 
to do it now and there's all kinds of applications now and in, and in the near future where this will be useful um cool so that was paco parts and attributes of common objects by meta ai uh thanks for watching and see you guys 